Hello, and a very warm welcome to this general surgical podcast on acute appendicitis. This podcast is brought to you by podmedics.com and Oxford University Press. The content for this podcast is based around a chapter from an excellent book in the Oxford Specialty Training Series titled Training in Surgery, the Essential Curriculum. This podcast, rather than being a comprehensive discussion, should give you a strong foundation in the basics of this common surgical condition on which to base your further reading and clinical experience in the hospital. Specifically, we shall be covering the etiology of appendicitis, including the important pathophysiological mechanisms. Then we shall be looking at the clinical assessment of a patient with suspected appendicitis. And finally, we shall be going through a basic approach to the management of such a patient. So first, let's consider appendicitis in general. Acute appendicitis is extremely common and is something that you will most certainly see in the accident and emergency department or when working on the general surgical take. A good general definition of appendicitis may be a surgical emergency characterised by acute inflammation of the vermiform appendix. Appendicitis may occur at any age, but has a peak incidence between 10 and 15 years of age. It is slightly more common in males than females. In the UK, 7% of people will have appendicitis at some point in their life. Although appendicitis can be very severe, if it is recognised and treated early, it has an excellent prognosis. Considering the etiology of acute appendicitis, the most common cause is thought to be obstruction of the appendiceal lumen. There are many potential causes of lumen blockage, but the most important include fecaliths, lymphoid hyperplasia, and sometimes worms. It is also important to remember that with increasing age, one needs to consider other causes such as appendiceal adenomas and cecal tumours. There is also a second type of acute appendicitis called phlegmonous appendicitis that is often associated with an upper respiratory tract infection. It is caused usually by primary bacterial or viral infection in the wall of the appendix and often runs a slower and more variable clinical course. Sometimes this is referred to as a grumbling appendix. In terms of the pathophysiology of obstructive, so that's the more common type of appendicitis, the story goes something like this. In the first place, there is obstruction of the lumen of the appendix, usually by a fecalith. This leads to an increase in intraluminal pressure and wall distension. Normal mucus secretion, however, continues from the appendix, and eventually this leads to occlusion of lymphatic and venous supply. Finally, the arterial supply becomes compromised, leading to ischemia and necrosis. This loss of normal function allows bacterial translocation and multiplication within the appendix. Occasionally, perforation then occurs due to weakness in the wall, secondary to necrosis and bacterial infection. It is important to remember that these events occur rapidly with the complete cycle taking anywhere from one to three days. This is why it is important to recognise and treat early if possible. So now let's move on to consider the clinical assessment of the patient who may have acute appendicitis. The classical history of acute appendicitis is abdominal pain that starts in the centre of the abdomen and is often vague in nature. This then worsens and localizes to the right iliac fossa. The pain is characteristically worse on movement. This is nearly always accompanied by varying degrees of anorexia, nausea and vomiting, thought to be secondary to bowel stasis. Fever may also occur, but is typically low grade, and by that I mean usually between 37.5 and 38.5 degrees. Moving on to examination, one can consider general features of the patient's examination and more specific features that one might find on an abdominal examination. General features that the patient may be displaying include appearing flushed and having a fever. The patient may also have signs of dehydration, a dry coated tongue and sometimes fetal oris. On examination of the abdomen, 
there may be restricted abdominal wall movement on deep respiration due to generalised or localised peritonism. However, the classical sign of acute appendicitis is tenderness in the right iliac fossa over McBurney's point. McBurney's point is found one third of the way along the line from the anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. Peritonism may also be present and may be either a localised or generalised peritonism. This is best elicited by percussion tenderness. In the case of a localised peritonism, percussion tenderness will be most apparent in the right iliac fossa, while in generalised peritonitis or peritonism it may appear all over the abdominal wall. There are a couple of eponymous signs in acute appendicitis that it is useful to know about. These include Rolfsing sign, the psoas stretch sign and the obturator sign. In Rolfsing sign, palpation in the left iliac fossa causes maximal pain in the right iliac fossa. The psoas sign is said to be positive when there is painful hip flexion with the patient supine. This represents associated inflammation of the psoas sheath in appendicitis. Finally, with the obturator sign, sometimes also known as the cope sign, there is painful hip flexion and internal rotation. Pain with this manoeuvre can indicate an inflamed appendix as the muscle of obturator internus causes pain on contact with the enlarged inflamed appendix. Now let's move on to consider some important investigations that can be used to exclude some important alternative diagnoses and to indeed support the diagnoses of acute appendicitis. So let's use our normal table of investigations. Starting with fluids and cultures, urinalysis should always be performed to exclude a urinary tract infection. However, it is important to note that appendicitis may cause pyuria and also microscopic hematuria. In addition to this, a urinary pregnancy test should always be carried out in any woman of childbearing age. A positive pregnancy test and right iliac fossa tenderness and pain could be the presentation of an ectopic pregnancy, and this is very important to exclude. In terms of the blood tests, one might wish to consider an arterial blood gas if the patient is very unwell, looking for an acidosis, altered base excess, and possibly raised lactate. For venous bloods, one would consider doing a full blood count, looking for a raised white cell count, and a CRP, which may also be raised in infection. In addition, it is routine practice to send bloods for urea and electrolytes, clotting, and a group and save. In terms of imaging, plain abdominal radiography should be performed in adults unless a diagnosis has been made clinically with confidence. Some non-specific radiological signs that may be suggestive of appendicitis on the abdominal film are the presence of a faecalith, a blurred right psoas margin, a localised ileus indicated by an abnormal right iliac fossa gas pattern, and possibly a scoliosis due to a painful posture. An ultrasound scan is particularly useful in women of childbearing age where gynaecological pathology is more likely. Important differential diagnoses here include ovarian cyst rupture and torsion. Finally, abdominopelvic CT should be considered for all adults where the diagnosis is unclear after a period of observation, where there is suspicion of an appendix mass or in the elderly population of patients where the differential diagnosis is often very wide and has significant impact on the choice of surgery. In terms of scopic investigations, laparoscopy may be used as a diagnostic procedure as well as offering the opportunity to proceed to appendicectomy. So now let's move on to the management of a patient with acute appendicitis. The initial management of the patient should include the standard resuscitation common to all pre-op surgical patients, including fluid resuscitation, analgesia and antiemetics if required. Often the diagnosis of appendicitis may not be completely clear. In this case, observation and repeated examination should be considered. During this period, the patient should remain nil by mouth and be given intravenous maintenance fluids. Blind antibiotic therapy should never be used until a diagnosis has been reached. The exception to this is in the case of frank peritonitis, where intravenous antibiotics should be started. 
The definitive treatment for appendicitis is appendicectomy, and this should be undertaken at the earliest opportunity as the rate of perforation is up to 40% in the first 36 hours and increases with time. Operative approaches to appendicectomy include laparoscopic appendicectomy and open appendicectomy. In uncomplicated cases of appendicitis, laparoscopic appendicectomy may have considerable advantages. There are often fewer wound infections, reduced post-operative pain and reduced inpatient length of stay. However, this should be balanced against increased operative time for the laparoscopic approach and increased operation cost. The two most important specific complications of appendicectomy are intra-abdominal abscess formation and collection and wound infection. Postoperatively, most uncomplicated cases of appendicitis can be managed on the ward with the patient allowed to eat and drink, take analgesia and mobilize as able. IV antibiotic therapy is usually given for 24 hours after the operation. Most uncomplicated cases are discharged from hospital around one day after their operation and should then be followed up in the surgical outpatients department. So in this podcast, we have looked at the etiology of acute appendicitis, specifically focusing on the pathophysiology of obstructive appendicitis. We have also looked at the typical clinical features of a patient presenting with acute appendicitis, including the history and examination findings. We have also systematically structured the necessary investigations that one should consider performing using our usual investigative strategy. Finally, we have considered some of the more important management options for a patient presenting with acute appendicitis, including initial management with fluids, analgesia and antiemetics, and some of the definitive operative managements, including laparoscopic and open appendicectomy. So, many thanks for listening to this podcast, and see you soon.